Thank you very much, Tulev. Um, it's been a pleasure and an honor to um, talk about my research field and, and try to provide you um, a small glimpse of, um, of this field that is um, developing quite fast. So my title of, the th uh, of this uh, presentation is Fishing for Genes That Matter. And as you heard, I'm, I'm studying mostly underwater organisms and mostly fish. So why study fish? As, as Rob previously very timely reminded us that we are living actually on a spaceship Earth. And if you look from far, it looks blue. And there is a reason. Because 70% of the, our Earth is covered by water. So you know, in order to understand how this spaceship functions and works, you better understand what's going on under the water. And so why study fish? Here you can see, for example, um, an evolutionary tree where all kind of main um, groups of uh, higher organisms are, are grouped. And you can see that there is barely 5,000, a little bit more than 5,000 mammalian species around. But there is more than actually, uh, or around 30,000 fish species. Um, and I hope there is no entomologist <laughs> around for certain reasons. Um, but the reason why there is a such a diverse group of organisms is that they diverged very long time ago. So when the, you can see that when the uh, reptiles and birds and mammals have been diverged. So there has been long time to separate and create such a diversity. So, and, and there is why study fish is there is extremely powerful laboratory models available uh, that uh, many people are studying. When I looked on, on Saturday evening, for example, how many articles there are in Web of Science about two fish species, uh, Dania rerio and Orusius latipes, which are the Japanese rice fish and uh, zebra fish, there is approximately 20,000 of them. And why we, why we are interested in these aquarium fishes? Of course, because we are interested about ourselves. So we are interested about the medical side of it. So they are extremely powerful models in the medicine, in evolutionary and developmental biology, in toxicology. You might have heard, for example, the fish that, or a zebra fish that if you put into the uh, polluted water, it turns green. So that's these kind of applications. Why, 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 there is, um, why fishes are uh, cool models. And of course, fish play a crucial role in aquatic and even terrestrial ecosystem functioning. You might have heard, for example, the how fish affect through the food webs, uh, the whole aquatic ecosystems, and how we can use them, for example, manipulating the amount of predatory fish, we get cleaner water through the food webs. Um, you might not have heard, for example, that also fish have a, have a role in, 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 in actually a climate change which is actually, I, I'll try to put it here, that, that uh, um, for example, the presence of fish actually controls a lot of the methane, methane uh, effluence in the lakes through the food webs again, that as you can see, fish eat zooplankton, zooplankton eat the methane eating bacteria, and then we get le less of it in, in our, uh, in, in our um, world. And, and um, Perhaps even important as well that um, carbon dioxide is in, in much, much kind of a milder um, a green uh, gas gas than, than met, uh, methane, for example. So uh, fish are important. Uh, and last but not least here, fish, I mean, we eat fish and we like to eat fish, and, um, but there is a problem. Well, the problem has been probably 20, 30 years already that you can see that the blue is the kind of consumption of the wild fisheries that it's not growing. I mean, even the technology has been really, really developing very fast. There is no fish in the sea anymore, so we cannot really improve on that. What we can do is to improve our aquaculture and actually growing fish ourselves. So it's a very important part why we should study fish and why as well genetics is an important part to improve the kind of disease resistance and how, how and all the processes there. 
Um, the question I ask, it's, it's, it's really, really, I mean, it's, it's nothing new. So I found the article, for example, why study fish? It's approximately 100 years ago, uh, a gentleman called Albert Hare, in, which, who was a very nice um, uh, fisheries biologist, also put forward that we study fish for some other reason. And I wanted to read you actually this one because I think it's very nicely written. So he wrote, and so when one watches the incomparable beauty and grace of living meteors that swarm about the coral reefs of the tropic seas and studies them in their environment, while the world of everyday affairs drops away from him, he is benefited in the same way that the wonderful landscape, a perfect sunset, or any work of art benefits of the beholder. So there is some other kind of more gentle um, values, if you wish, that uh, many of us probably um, uh, enjoy. And if you still are not convinced, I, I really suggest you to read a wonderful book about the biography of the fish that changed the world. And this is not understatement. So it, it actually the caught, the caught the fish uh, that's changed our world. Okay, hope you are convinced now about fishes. What about genes? Why study fish genes? So, I mean, as, as, as you know, and as you I already said, fish are adapted to extremely wide environmental conditions in the kind of the bottom of the oceans and almost on the mountain tops. And there is extremely high uh, both intra and intraspecific diversity of fish. Here, you, I mean, you can see that uh, all types of fish from, from, from huge sunfish that weighs for over almost a ton compared to a small, tiny cyprinids on, on, on the right side of you that might weigh uh, or uh, be only six or seven millimeters long that live in uh, Indonesian uh, uh, peat swamps, for example. So there is an enormous diversity out there, and not only between species, but also within species. As I put it here, some kind of plate morph variation in sticklebacks and, and some other variation, for example, in, 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 in you know, very familiar fish to Swede, uh, Swedes as well, aborra or perch. I'll go back to that later. So, so there is a lot of diversity, but the underlying these kind of processes that what generates this and how can we har har harness this are not very well understood. And, and traditionally, all the genetic work has been applied in a very, very uh, small set of model species like mice, like Drosophila, fruit fly, and some other these kind of very well-known and very powerful models. Um, and, and until very recently, the whole fields of ecology, like people in the rubber boots walking in somewhere in the wild, and then the genetics, very clean, have been like going very separate paths. However, things have changed in a, in a recent, um, recently or the last 20 years. And, and that, that change came with this genetic revo I mean revolu technological revolution in genetics, which is brought by the next generation sequencing. And this kind of, uh, basically, the one uh, uh, who know about Moore's law, that you know, our, the microchips have been kind of doubling the power every 18 to 12 months for quite some time now, making our uh, kind of uh, computers more and more powerful. However, the next generation sequencing technology, has, as shown here, it actually developed even much faster. So this is the logarithmic scale here. For example, that when in, uh, 2000, sorry, in 2001, for example, if the human genome sequencing cost 100 million uh, US dollars, now we are back to like 1,000 dollars. So it has been extremely fast uh, de uh, development of the technologies and extremely kind of a um, uh, sharp uh, decrease of prices. Yes, and 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 that's the time when this new 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 research field has been kind of starting to develop and really to emerge, which is called ecological genomics. That we can use the genomic methods to, to study natural environments and organisms that are living there. 
And, and what, what this field wants to describe is the kind of what is the genetic uh, basis of the variation in all sorts of traits and species, and what explains the fitness. And this is some kind of uh, illustrations that in 2003 there was few opinion articles that this would be a great field to be kind of started. In 2006 there was a new first book on this one, and 2012 already the second version, and so on. So now there are conferences and kind of uh, very special workshops all over the place. So it is a quite um, interesting field to be part of. So what is the goal? As I said, it's to study the structure and functioning of the genome and to understand the relationships between the organism and the environment. And usually what, what the ecological genomics is focusing is like this kind of relationship between three things. The genotype, how the genotype uh, um, uh, creates the phenotype, and what is the links between the phenotype and fitness, and how this fitness comes back to the genotype. So it's basically combining what the genetics and the ecology, in, in essence, using uh, different methods. And here are marked some of them, but these are not perhaps most important for now. So how to find the genes that matter? Uh, remember that the genomes are enormously big. So if somebody says, yes, I sequence the genome, which is three gigabases long, it doesn't say too much, probably many people. So three gigabases, okay, it's three. So three gigabases is three billion base pairs, so there are nine zeros after three. Fine. But humans are really hard to actually grasp big numbers, I think, because, you know, you understand if you have a hundred something or maybe a thousand, but three billion, not very good. So to understand, to help you, for example, how big is three billion? So what these methods want to do is to, let's say that if we assume that one base pair is one millimeter long, then human genome is from Uppsala to some very warm place close to Barcelona. So that's, that's how big the human genome is, and many genomes. And what these methods want to do is to find this one millimeter along this road that's causing this phenotypic trait. And that's quite extraordinary to see how powerful these methods can be to find one millimeter along this road that actually affects the phenotype. And, and here are some of the examples of them, genome scans, whole genome associations, and, and so on. But I would like to provide you a few examples of the first one because we don't have too much time. So what the genome scans do is to tr try to find the footprints of selection. So you compare two populations that are different, black and white, growing differently, whatever the trait you are interested in. And what you want to look is the kind of islands along the, in, in the uh, genome that show very high differentiation between these populations. So differentiation means that the alleles that have are very different allele frequency between populations. So basically you find the, try to find these high differentiation islands across the genomes. And why? Because these islands then perhaps contain the genes that actually cause the variation that we see in a phenotype. So you screen that genome across across the genomes using very many different markers. And here is one example, for example, how these islands of divergence might look like. And this is all very familiar to Swedes, which is the sturming, herring. And, and for example, if you study the herring across the Baltic from the salinity gradient from very north up to the basically Danish Straits where they live in a very salt water and, and, and it's trying to find these areas that are very different between these freshwater or almost freshwater and very saltwater populations, you see these islands that are on the, on the right side, that each of these pump contains these genes that probably contribute to this, why populations are able to live very north and very south. So we, we these kind of... And so population geneticists are very eager and, and interested to finding these bumps and finding the genes, finding their functions, what they do. However, we don't know too much about the phenotype here. We know that there has been selection, probably these genes are important, 
but strumming looks very similar all over the Baltic. Well, they might be a little bit bigger down south, but other than that. So the challenge is to also incorporate the phenotype. So what do we know about that? And, and here is one example of, a, of, of probably the most well-known examples in biology and ecological genomics where people are able to link the genetics, the phenotype variation, and also the selection in the wild. So it's three spine stickleback. And what this fish has is like interesting phenotypic variation. On, 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 uh, on the left side, you can see that it has these kind of uh, plates, uh, bony plates that protect them in the sea where they live. But these fish also live in freshwater. And in, a, in very many freshwater lakes, and they tend to lose these plates. So we see populations without these plates. And, and this has kind of occurs repeatedly. So there is some kind of, uh, uh, so it's not random. And, and the people very early started to kind of being interested on that and seeing that, okay, can we find the genetic basis of this? And they found kind of using the, some genetic mapping methods, they have pointed out that one gene, which is called EDA or nearby this one, is probably contains this gene that causes this variation. And then next genomic analyses indeed find that there is this kind of a section in near EDA gene and nearby that actually causing this, this variation that we see. And it's not just one mutation, but there are several. So the challenge is still to understand what every single mutation does and is there some interactions and epigenetic effects. And basically also if you put the fresh water, this fragment into the sea fish, like doing the transgenetic thing, it grows back these plates. So we have a, like a real evidence, it's not correlative, but if you kind of increase the uh, expression of this EDA gene, the stickleback starts to grow these back, these plates. Okay, so we know this genotype-phenotype link now, but what about selection? So how, why, why we see in the freshwaters, for example, why do they lose it? And, and this is where the ecology comes back, for example. What we know is that in a marine, these plates probably give a protection. Um, but in, in the fresh water, what we see is probably it's easier to be without the plates. So you grow faster, you reproduce earlier, high, higher survival, maybe swim a little bit faster, have a lateral line, and so on. So it's, it's all these kind of, you have to know what, the, how the different kind of phenotypes, how it affects the, the performance of the fish. And for example, here are in, in, the, in the right side, there are some very nice examples where, for example, if the population has been established in a fresh water, within 10 years, you see that 50-50 proportion of like with and without the plates, it's almost 90% of fish are without the plates. So it, evolution is very, can be very fast and very efficient. But I put it here also in a, in a little bit, if you look even closer, there are still a lot of things we don't understand. Because we, for example, if you look just within two years, we see that actually the plate uh, uh, frequency goes down somehow and then goes up. So why it goes down and so on. So there are still a lot of to understand about the ecology of this. And, but nevertheless, we, we, I think now we have a reasonably good grasp on already what kind of variation affects the phenotypes. Is it coding or re regulatory changes? Are they single nucleotide polymorphism or some other variation like copy number variation or inversions? So we are starting to get a grasp what actually affects uh, the phenotypes, what we see in the wild now. And there are also a lot of um, new avenues that ha haven't been there at all. Um, for example, the environmental DNA you can study the DNA in the water and not actually focusing on organisms, but actually because the organisms give the DNA into the water, they shed it. You can study it basically taking the glass of water rather than trying to catch your white tiger or some shark. You can study the uh, shark DNA in the water. There is ancient DNA, so the DNA actually stores in, in the sediments and, and in the museum, so you can study these ones. And of course, I'm studying, uh, for most of the part, I've, I've been studying only the, the fish genomes, but there are other genomes. As, as you all know, there are also the micro, 
microbes and their genomes that affects us all. So it's another totally new research field. And so on, the, all these omics approaches, transcriptomes, proteomes, epigenomes that are really, really um, growing nowadays. And, and uh, there are possibilities to do the research but that we didn't have before. And, and also single cell RNA. So we are able to actually uh, study the gene expression on single cell level and, and, and do it in, in, in massively parallel way. So it's, it's very uh, exciting. And with this, I think my time is almost up, so thank you a lot. <laughs>